Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelsey. Uh, this is my colleague, Nishla. Uh, we are software engineers over at Microsoft. We work on the Linux kernel team over there. Um, so today, we're wanting to help give an introduction to the Linux kernel, um, a little bit of a start of what it is, um, how you can get into maybe start customizing it and start contributing upstream if that's something that you're interested or even just interested in knowing how that works. Um, so, oh yeah. <laughs> All right, so the first thing to get into, of course, is what is the Linux kernel? So it is the core component of the Linux operating system. Um, all the operating systems are gonna have kernels in it. Um, it manages the hardware and software interactions, um, enables things like multitasking, resource management, um, input output requests, handling memory. A lot of a lot of workings go into what the kernel does. It's of course a very important part of every operating system. Um, and it, there's a lot to it. Um, it can generally be very intimidating to get into. Um, lots of information. There is so much it is something that you're never gonna know all of it. And that's a little bit exciting. It can also be a little intimidating, of course. So um, Linux kernel was created by Linus Torvalds back in 91. Um, it has been growing a lot ever since then, um, now with thousands of contributors around the world. Lots of companies have Linux kernel teams, which is awesome. We all get to contribute towards a, it's what's called the upstream kernel. We'll get more into kind of that, and a lot of companies will have their own customized kernels as well. Um, but it, it all is based on what we're gonna refer to as the upstream, is this what everybody, most people collaborate towards, and then we bring it down in customize it from there. So um, we will dig into that more. So on this first part, we're going to get a little bit into the subsystem structure. Initial is going to cover that. Um, just keep in mind, a lot of this is very high level. Um, as an introduction, we want to be able to give concepts, um, things that you'll be able to research later. There's a lot of information that we're going to be covering here too. Of course, it's not going to be a test. You don't have to remember it all. Um, and we're going to provide resources at the end, so it gives you an opportunity to be able to dig into all of this later on your own. And of course, you're always able to check the resources, reach out to us if you have questions, and there's a huge community out there to help as well. So, right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the various subsystems in the Linux kernel, um, mostly just a high-level overview of what each subsystem does. Um, so like you can see in the picture, there, there can be multiple applications or multiple processes that are running on top of the kernel. And one of the first things that I want to talk about is the process subsystem, which basically manages a process's life cycle. So it includes uh, what happens when a process is created and how the processes are scheduled and how a process is terminated. So those things are basically what the process subsystem manages. And there's also the scheduling algorithms around um, when a process needs to be scheduled on a CPU. So process subsystem is kind of the main subsystem that manages anything around the process lifecycle. And the second thing I want to talk about is the memory subsystem. So this is the subsystem that comes into picture when um, memory needs to be allocated. So this is basically physical memory and also virtual memory, which is basically the abstraction for different processes about the underlying resource that the hardware has, which is basically the RAM. So the next subsystem is the file system. Uh, so the VFS is the virtual file system, which kind of uh, has a common, provides a common set of APIs for read, write, um, and other syscalls, which kind of trap into different file systems based on the underlying uh, physical storage device. So VFS is like an abstraction before um, the calls go down to the file system specific calls. So the next thing is the networking stack. So the networking stack is basically what's responsible for how a packet is processed from user space all the way down to the kernel. So the kernel has um, basically uh, a bunch of drivers which enable you to talk to the underlying network interface card. So the entire TCP IP stack which is responsible for what happens when data is passed through a socket at the application layer, all the way down to the NIC card is kind of handled by the kernel itself. Uh, and the next thing is device drivers. So this is basically the subsystem that handles different kind of hardware that gets plugged into the computer, like the keyboard, the mouse, what happens when you have a display port attached to your computer. So device driver subsystem is kind of what manages um, how different 
devices are handled in the kernel. And the next thing is architecture-specific logic. So this is basically um, processor-specific logic that uh, is uh, present in the kernel tree, uh, which is responsible for supporting different processes. Uh, so everything else that I spoke about earlier is process, uh, processor-independent, and the architecture-specific subsystem is basically what manages based on what kind of CPU um, the hardware is made of. So can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so this is kind of the structure of the kernel tree. And I'm, uh, I basically had this to kind of map what directories map to what subsystems. So there's the MM directory, which is the memory managed subsystem. And then there's the NET directory, which is the networking subsystem. And then there's the FS directory for the file system or the VFS subsystem. So that's kind of how the kernel is split. Um, so this is, this is actually the entire tree. And uh, Kelsey is going to talk about where to extract this tree from and how to build a kernel and what's the process um, that needs to be followed in terms of getting the kernel and building it and compiling it. All right. So um, this page here is the Linux kernel archives. So this is going to point you to what I was referring to as the upstream kernel. This is the one that a lot of us all contribute to. This is kind of the kernel rule them all, like the upstream, the primary one, and a lot of the distributions out there, like if you're thinking Ubuntu, so forth, they're, they're going to be pulling from this tree and then generally adding customizations on top of that. Um, so if you want the original source, this is where you're going to go to get it. Um, sometimes people prefer, of course, getting ones from you can go over to Ubuntu and they provide their kernels as well, and you can download those. Um, even like, you know, at Microsoft, I work on the Windows for subsystem for Linux has its own kernel. You can even, you can get that. We have our own GitHub page and it has its own customizations. And um, this is where I pull updates from as well. And we try to stay as close to the upstream as possible. So that is generally, a lot of times in a lot of companies, that's the goal is we want to contribute to this kernel and then we're going to be pulling that into our products and we want to try to keep as true to upstream as possible. Um, so this is where you go, go to kernel.org. Um, you'd be able to, as you see, there's several options of how you can get different kernels. Um, there's a long list here, um, mainline, stable, long-term, you see a bunch of fun numbers. We'll get a little bit more into um, kind of the cycle of how these are released and I'll get into what each one is a little bit more later, but just know if you wanna get started and just do a git clone, get one of these kernels to get started, um, save this website, and this is where you're gonna go to retrieve that. Um, again, also, anything we reference, I have on a resource page, and you, we do did upload the slides onto Sketch, so you can access those, you wanna reference it later. So once you get your kernel, a lot of times what you wanna do is play with it, modify it, have fun with it, break it, do the fun things. Um, super easy way to get into it is, one thing I try to tell people is you don't have to have a huge understanding of C or Rust now, or um, even how the kernel works to start playing with your kernel. If you want to get some kind of benefit or customize in your kernel, really you just maybe know a little bit of Git is going to be your base. That's gonna be wanting to get your, get your tree downloaded, and then you can get started and learn as you go. So I think a lot of people are very intimidated getting into kernel work, and you know, it's once you get it started, you just make little steps, right? Um, it doesn't have to be intimidating. You don't have to know all the things. Um, that's very okay. So the where I recommend anyone who's getting started to start playing with your kernel and customizing it is the configs. So there's a very large configuration file. Um, what this is gonna be is you see a little list of things you can do with that. So you can enable or disable features, um, optimize the performance. A lot of things are gonna be like support for new hardware. So a lot of people will customize their kernel to be lightweight as possible by disabling all this hardware support that a lot of people have, but they don't have that hardware. So that's a great way, like maybe you want to have a quicker boot time, so you can do that. Um, and then there's a ton of different debugging options. Maybe there's something you're trying to debug, you're uh, managing something, you're trying to debug it, like a file system. Maybe you want the file system debugging option isn't turned on. This is where you're gonna go to turn that on. So um, this is a great place to get started. Um, all these little, little make things, um, they all are gonna result to the same thing. So it's kind of a pick your own adventure. What are you comfortable with? Do you wanna 
change your configs through a graphical interface or a text interface. Um, this one that's pictured is make menu config. This is the one I tend to go to. Um, it's pretty user friendly, which is great. Um, the only one I don't really recommend for beginners is configuring the file manually. Some configs depend on other configs. You um, change one config that something's dependent on, you might break things. So um, it, fun way to play around and see what breaks things. But um, I always recommend one of these top ones are a little bit safer. And you can always uh, do a, it's called a GIF diff, diff the files. And sometimes it's fun to see, like change a config, diff uh, old config in your new one and see what all changed. So if you want to just get started, this is where I recommend to start playing with your stuff. Um, then obviously the next part is modifying code. So you can either add your own code, um, you can maybe get code from somebody else. Um, super common way, something, maybe somebody wants a feature or a fix that is in a kernel you don't have. Maybe you are running an old version, but you're happy with your old version. And somebody released a version that, you know, or a feature that's maybe not released even. You can add that, you can add your own, um, and that's kind of things like doing like a security fix. That's huge, that's important. Um, that's actually really common for like whether it's us maintaining kernels, like even like at your favorite distros, a lot of what they do is going to be finding fixes that might not be, they're gonna be on like a certain kernel version and pulling in updates, but there might be an important fix that they need to, it's called backporting, where they're gonna go grab it from a different a future kernel and bring it in. Because um, it's not always an option to be on the latest and greatest. We need stability, but sometimes we need to pull in some fixes. So these are all things that you're able to do on your own. Um, so after you get used to the config files, getting in and just messing with the code. Sometimes it can be fun, delete code, see what happens, or um, add things and just kind of see how it alters or even like doing hardware control. So there is lots of stuff you can do, which is, is yeah, it can be a lot of fun. So um, the building your kernel, I was a little skeptical even putting it in here, but it feels important, of course. That is gonna be an important step, but it is, we're gonna go through this a little quickly. The reason being is depending on the distribution you're running, these steps might vary a little bit. It's gonna be generally the same. As you can see here, it kinda says like on Ubuntu, on Red Hat based system, on SUSE. Um, so we're gonna go in the general basics. Just know, depending on your distro, you can go in reference, there's gonna be Generally, the standard commands you're going to run through, it might vary a little bit. So you'll want to look up your distro and find. But we're going to go through the general steps to show you. So first step is to make sure your, your setup has the packages it needs to do the build. So make sure your package is set up. Oh, and by the way, I actually caught, I wanted to show an example of the documentation out there. There is a lot of documentation out there. Sometimes it's just finding it. This is from copied directly from a website called Kernel Newbies. This is a common website to give out to anybody that's getting into kernel development to find a very wide array of instructions. So this is a great website. I also have it linked at the end. Um, and I, this is where I pulled the instructions from as a reference point. So step one, make sure your system's set up with the packages and dependencies it needs. Um, then you're going to build the kernel. Um, it is as simple as uh, you're just going to be in your kernel tree and you're going to run make. Um, you see a like, little flag here, a dot, dash, a dash J. Um, you can speed it up by adding more processors to it. Um, it does take a while. It can take a while unless you have a lot of resources to give to it. So do be prepared for that. There's a lot that's building. Once it builds, you make a little change. It'll be a little quicker. I'll remember that unless you clean it all out and make it start over again. Um, so it's not that bad instruction-wise to actually get this, um, get this build. Um, as you see here, there's a little link that says, read some comics. I couldn't leave it out because it is one of, I think, the, one of the better um, XACD comics. So had to put that in there. Um, but it does. It can take a while. So be prepared for that. You need research. Go have fun. Do something. Um, don't, I don't recommend just watching it and seeing what it's doing unless you are really into that. Um, once you have it built, of course, you want to install it. Again, this is kind of as simple as just running another make command. Um, what you see here is it's going to install, there's a bunch of modules. Um, so those are going to be like different kinds of module supports, a wide variety of what they do. Um, so you're going to do like a modules install and then um, 
and then the install is so actually going to install the kernel to your system. Um, some distros, be warning, there are different instructions for this if they use like a type of packaging, like uh, Ubuntu uses like, you know, the Debian packaging, and sometimes they're going to be like, oh, put it into a Debian package, and then you're going to install it that way. So be aware there might be different instructions, and it is kind of a sometimes choose your own venture, find what's going to work for your distribution, your setup, and um, yeah, your setup. And then you're going to also need to update your grub. So the grub is going to be for booting. Um, this is, it's going to be um, so no, letting your computer know this is installed. This is going to be an option for booting. Um, anytime you restart, you're going to update your grub. And then from here, you just uh, restart your computer. And it's going to boot with the latest kernel. Now, I'm going to give a giant warning here. Always keep your old safe kernels, at least one, installed. <laughs> um, if your kernel doesn't work, your system will not boot. Um, that is so always keep a safe kernel if you want to be extra safe especially where you're starting spin up a vm to get started that way you know if you're just lost you don't know what to do you know it's as much as starting up another virtual machine for you um that's always a super safe way to to do this but keep a kernel a safe kernel as a backup always that you can default to because if you start customizing a kernel at some point you're gonna you're gonna build one that's not gonna boot for you all right so um, once you have your new kernel up and running, uh, next step you're going to want to do is know how to test and debug your kernel. Maybe you're either wanting to find a regression or you're running into an issue and you don't know where to check. Um, Nishal is going to take over this part. So when it comes to testing the kernel, it pretty much comes down to what is the change that we made. And when I say what's the change, it's not necessarily a single line or a hundred lines, but it basically depends on the nature of the change, right? So let's say if you're changing the data type of a variable from UN32 to UN64, that's something that can be quickly verified by assigning values to the variable, add a quick print k, kind of look at the dmessage log. So dmessage is basically the log that's, uh, that, cap that captures everything that's coming out of the kernel. So print k messages are visible in the dmessage log. So a quick way to check something small is add print k's and look at the dmessage log. So when it comes to bigger changes, um, like adding a new feature, and let's say you add a new .c file and you want to test it um, through the automated framework, there are a couple of frameworks that are available. One is the LTP, that's the Linux test project. Uh, so the source code for that is available on GitHub. It's not a part of the kernel, but it's basically a test suite that kind of tests the stability and reliability of the kernel itself. So it takes about three to four hours to actually run the entire test suite. So let's say, for example, somebody is changing uh, the memory allocator, for example, right? Like somebody is changing a config flag associated with how buddy allocator works. So that kind of change is scary. And that needs to go through the entire test suite where everything else is allocating memory. And you want to you want to see how that change is impacting the rest of the kernel, right? So that's LTP. And the other automated testing framework that we have is the K self tests. So this one takes slightly um, shorter amount of time. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes to run the tests. And uh, it's a part of the kernel, although it uh, is like a user space program, meaning all the C code and the binaries are running as user space process. So this is primarily used to um, test things that interact between the user space and the kernel. Let's say, for example, syscall. So if you're adding a new, new syscall, then definitely adding a new k-self-test is a good idea. So um, that's the main um, tools that we have to test the kernel. And other than that, uh, there are multiple tools for analyzing the code changes that we're making while in the development process. So there's like a bunch of static analysis tools. Um, there's a, a script called CheckBatch, which is one of the basic tools that all of us use to kind of um, check the code style and fix things before um, sending it for review upstream. And there's also a bunch of dynamic tools like KMM check, KMM leak, and kernel address sanitizer, which kind of helps um, understand if there are memory leaks and if there's use after free errors. So uh, it's, it's a mix of testing tools that you can kind of plug and play based on the nature of the change itself. Um, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about debugging the kernel. So other than printk and dmessage, there's basically a bunch of config flags available in the kernel. 
um, they kind of start with config underscore debug. And based on the subsystem that you're testing, there's more configs that you can enable and re rebuild the kernel to kind of see extra information to understand what's going on in the system. So um, definitely play around with the additional debugging configs that are available. Um, and the other thing is function trace, that's the F trace. Um, so basically it's a part of the debug FS file system where uh, you could actually set a filter on the function that you want to trace. And once that um, function is hit in the execution of the program, uh, you should be able to see a graph of who's calling that function. So F trace is kind of useful for a lot of other things as well. Um, so that's something that's very handy to use. Um, one of my favorite is the dump stack function. It basically prints the stack trace um, in the code. So usually when there's a kernel panic or a kernel oops, there's a nice stack trace that kind of tells us who's calling which function and what's the faulty address. But dump stack is kind of handy when you don't want the kernel to crash, but you still want to know who's calling who. And that's like a lazy way of figuring out then navigating different files. So on the right hand side is a picture of how dump stack works. So um, basically, uh, there's a file that uh, is being written into in the proc file system. So we are echoing a number three into a proc file. And it goes through uh, the syscall API. Um, so syscall write gets translated into the VFS layer. And the VFS write further gets translated into the module specific uh, write syscall. So yeah, that's one of the handy functions. Uh, and other than that, there's also object dump and there's also adder to line. So these are tools that kind of um, operate on addresses. So basically once you have an address, you can actually figure out which line in the kernel and uh, which file in the kernel is causing the fault itself. So both of them need VM Linux, which is basically the statically linked kernel, which has all the object files together. So once you have VM Linux generated, you can use object dump and adder to line to kind of translate the faulty address that you have. And just by running a single command, you can figure out which is the line that's causing the crash. So GDB, as usual, um, just uh, run, running GDB on VM Linux itself lets you get into the debugger. And uh, you can do a ton of things with GDB and uh, there's also something, something called list star programming, which will let you uh, inspect the kernel data structures and um, what the fields are. Um, so that's where GDB becomes helpful. There's a lot more things to kernel debugging than just GDB. So I have a little link there to kind of um, summarize everything that we have um, that could be useful. So what happens after testing and debugging, that's when we're kind of confident that whatever change that we made is upstream ready, or we think about sending the patches upstream, right? So Kelsey is going to talk about what, what that process looks like. Um, so I'll hand it over to her. Uh, so we kind of reference a couple times is sending stuff upstream, it's important. So even if you're messing around and you do a little change, you want to see it, maybe it's useful to other people, you can send it upstream. If it's a fix, definitely like send it up, send it upstream. That's a huge part of the beauty about, of course, open source, right? Is we're all kind of helping to a better product that's going to benefit everybody, right? So of course we want to encourage, fix something that is, you can find it anywhere else. Um, send it somewhere. So a huge part of where we're going to kind of cover is a little bit of the that process. What what does it look like? What does the release cycle look like upstream? Um, and then also ways that you can contribute and the resources to be able to do that. So um, to get to kind of get started, a little bit of the development process to so see an outline of what it looks like. Is there's of course multiple steps. Like let's say if you you have a change, you made a change, you built a patch, you you tested it, you're confident in it. Um, at this point, you're the developer. Um, now, Nisha had mentioned all these different subsystems that are in the kernel, and different subsystems have maintainers. So there's going to be a maintainer, so think like memory management, networks, um, PCI. So let's say you made a PCI change. You're going to want to send that to the PCI maintainer. And that maintainer is going to review it. It's going to go into a huge part we haven't covered yet is mailing lists. Um, 
Linux kernel is widely, all the communication is done on mailing lists. So you're going to be sending it to a mailing list. And we'll, we will cover a little bit more on the mailing list here. So um, what you do is you send it, the patch to the maintainer. It's going to be via this mailing list. The maintainer wants to say, the community signs off on it. Maintainer says it's good. Um, they're going to send it what's called Linux Next. Um, this branch is like, kind of think of it, the experiment branch in a sense. Um, this is where we send things to get, where people can access it, test it. Um, it's a little risky if you're going to be trying to use this on your like dev machine or something. But um, all the latest things that are going to be going into like a next kernel release generally are going to go to Linux Next for, Next for testing. So that's why it kind of branches off there. Um, once there's confidence in it, it's going to get sent into mainline. So this is actually Linus's tree. Um, it is maintainers send it then to mainline. This is going to be the primary, the next like big release is where this goes. And then once it, mainline is released, it's considered a stable kernel. So that's where we go through lots of testing. It's going to be stable. And um, from, we'll just jump to this next slide, is there is a new stable kernel release about every, was it like nine to 10 weeks, depending on how many bugs are found, how much fixes have to go into it. Um, so you can kind of see like, if, say if we just had a new release today, there's gonna be a two week merge window. And this is where all the maintainers are gonna send their patches that are ready into, um, up for mainline to get merged. Um, this is gonna be for that next release that's gonna happen in that two to, two to three month period. Um, so once everything is determined, the merge window is closed, we go into what is kind of the testing period. So these are patches that are, or kernels that are called like, uh, they're pre-patch. So up here you see pre-patch. Um, you actually, I've always called them um, release candidates. Um, if you look at the kernel name, it's like a dash RC um, with a number. And these are sent, it's always announced on a mailing list. Everything's done through mailing lists. And it will, it's going to be put out there for people to test. And if a regression is, or a bug is found, something is found that is wrong with it, you report that, people are going to fix it, or you fix it, and then a new release candidate is put out until there's confidence in it. And then that's when it's going to become a new, the new stable release. Um, generally, I believe there's about, um, I think the goal is like generally around, or it's average like eight pre-releases before like within each of these cycles um, that can greatly vary of course because you, know, you never know how many fixes if we're going to find a new problem that's going to need to be fixed um, there are also release candidates for like once a kernel is released and it's stable there's no new features that go to that it is only bug fixes so they'll still get updates but it is only bug fixes nothing new will go to that like new feature wise but those still, anything that's stable, like right now, um, I think the latest release was the 6.3, that is only getting fixes now. Um, so there's still a, once it gets a fix, there's still a release candidate that gets sent out. And we'll actually touch on that because it's a great way to contribute back upstream is to test those. But those are actually a 48 hour window of where you have to test those. And a lot of times there's only one release candidate gets sent. Sometimes you see it go into that two to three if a, if a problem is found. All right, so um, about in that like 10 week period, we get a new stable um, kernel and kind of replaces that, the old one. But about once a year is there, you're gonna get a, what's considered a long-term support kernel. Um, they're maintained for about two years. So instead of getting replaced once a new release is there, they're, they're, they're about two years, they can get extended. That's not a hard set thing. Um, these are generally the ones like a lot of distributions will go with um, to be, because it's going to be a little bit more reliable because it is getting maintained for longer. So a lot of dis uh, distros are going to be picking like a, what's called an LTS kernel because that is going to be maintained for a long period of time. It's easy for you to pick up and continue to maintain and develop and have that consistency. Um, so as like I reference, you know, it's easy for me to reference WSL, the Windows um, the subsystem for Linux, just because since I work on that, like we always stick with the LTS. So currently we were on 5.15 and we just jumped to 6.1. And then, you know, come next year when the next LTS will jump to that. And that's a pretty common thing for, um, like you'll see your, 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 a lot of your distros like Ubuntu and so forth to do as well. So the mailing list I was talking about, there are Lots of mailing lists. All the communication is done through mailing lists. There are things like IRC channels still or other communication forms, but you're going to be mostly doing mailing lists. Um, I listed some of them here. Um, 
a lot of subsystems have a mailing list, so it's kind of learning which mailing list do you want to participate on? Um, where are you going to go? If you have a like a KVM fix, you're going to want to send it to like the KVM and to that mailing list for the people to review. If you see here in bold, I have this one, like Linux kernel one. That is the primary mailing list. That is a very active mailing list. Like you can subscribe to any of these if you're interested. Um, I only recommend subscribing to that one if you are ready to filter those messages somewhere else. There are like hundreds a day. It will flood your mailbox. So very interesting. Um, there are archives. So you don't have to subscribe to these to see them. This website here, if you go to this, you can go through and view any of these um, mailing lists. There, there's mirrors. You can go through and see. They're very updated, active. Um, so that's a great way to do it without getting your mailbox over, over flooded. And you can see there's, sometimes there's even like Linux newbie um, ones, like sometimes there, there is like a C, yeah, Linux C programming, and you can go in there and sometimes, it doesn't always have to be like patches and so forth, sometimes it, there's, there are mailing lists for conversations. Um, some are more active than others, of course, as you can see, like number of subscribers, there's quite the variety. And if you do go to this website, you'll see there is a ton more mailing lists. So you kind of go to the ones you're interested in, don't subscribe to all of them. You'll get very overwhelmed. Um, maybe just like pick a couple and uh, start with that. Um, so a huge part, one of the biggest questions that I think I get asked by anyone who's interested in checking things out is where do they get started? Other than of course, what you, like the downline and so forth, like how do they actually contribute, especially if they've been customizing their kernel and they want to like maybe get into a kernel job, like how do they get experience or anything like that. And um, there's a couple different ways you can do that. Um, one of them is testing the release candidates that I mentioned earlier. So there is, um, if you go on to the, you can check like the Linux kernel mailing list or the stable mailing list. Um, and if you look, I did a screenshot of one of them. And what I always do is I just like, I have a script, I'll check for this review. I'll look for review or you can do, it always starts off with this message with uh, this is the start of the stable review cycle. You can search that and that way you can find it. Um, these one, this one specifically is for a kernel that is already stable. So you can see it says, um, yeah, it gives you about a time. If you check when it was sent to the timeline, it's about two days. And all you need to do is you um, download the kernel. There's a Git, uh, Git source for it. Just download it, build it, and boot it. And then you can do more tests for it. Any information is good information. So sometimes um, I might only have time to literally build and boot the kernel. And then I will check, um, Nishla brought up dmessage. That's a very good log to check any for any errors. And I keep a little log and I'll diff it and I'll see if anything new pops up or any critical errors. And then you can just report that. And that's a great way to just start giving back because you literally just need to build and boot built the, the kernel. It's a great way to just get started, find a good way to start contributing on the mailing list and also break that, maybe that intimidation barrier of just sending those emails. Um, this is also super useful because there's a lot of hardware out there and it, there's a lot of things. And if you find it doesn't boot or you find a message, you want to report that before this gets released. Um, that way, um, if there's a commit that we can, that can get dropped um, and then re-released, uh, that is great because it's much easier to fix it in this stage than after it's already released. Um, then, of course, the next way that you can start contributing is it's always good to report bugs. If you don't know how to fix something, um, reporting things is, that is super important. Um, do keep in mind if try to report it to the right place, there are kind of, th I think, three general places. There's upstream, there's, if you're distro, maybe you're running a distro kernel, it might be distro specific if you're unsure can always report it to both. Somebody's going to say, this isn't relevant to us and can close it. And sometimes it's just good to let people be aware. Can also be like a testing issue. Um, like maybe if you're, those are always opportunities, like the test suite that Nishla was talking about. Those are open source projects too that you can also contribute to. Or sometimes we'll find like maybe we'll think there's a regression, but really it's just a test that needs to get updated. Um, and then going to the next is the fixing bugs. If you found a bug or if you don't know where to look, you can also go to this is Bugzilla. This is a common place to report bugs for upstream. You see it down at the bottom. There's like a little like bugs reported in the last 24 hours, um, last seven days. 
you always look for bugs to fix. So if you have no idea, you just want to do something, search, search on here. See if there's something that you feel confident starting to dig into. Um, you can also search the kernel tree for to-dos, um, and you can find a lot of fun ways to participate in there. Um, mailing list, you can find work to do. Sometimes uh, somebody's maybe sending something and um, it no longer applies um, to a tree and they need help. They might not have time. You can always get in and help people on the mailing list. Those are just can be a little more difficult to find unless you're already active on the mailing list and you're paying attention to them. So these are generally a little bit more beginner friendly ways to um, find, find work. Um, I'm, yeah, so yeah, this is, this is probably a good starting point. Um, I'm only going to touch on this part a little bit is um, if you're going to send something upstream, there is, there is some guidelines you want to follow to get your patch acknowledged um, to be successful in contributing. So you, Git is used everywhere, so it's important to have a bit of an understanding on how Git, you, wanna, you can use Git to send, to create and send your format and send your patches. Um, you always want to be detailed in your descriptions. What are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish? Basically think if somebody's good, if you're going to review a patch, what would you want to know? So imagine you're sending it to somebody who doesn't understand. Somebody doesn't want to take time to try to understand what your code is doing. Do a good description is always helpful. And then especially if there's an error later on and um, your patch is somehow related, they're going to see what that change, why that change was. Um, so details are very important. Um, also, doing small changes. Um, you don't want to do a massive, um, say, if you're adding like an entire driver, you don't want to just put it all in one commit because it's really hard to review. It's hard to debug if anything is wrong. So try to break things into logical changes. Um, picking the right people to review your patch. You don't want to send a um, networking fix to the PCI, right? Like, unless they're relevant, of course. Um, so there's actually a script that you can use to help. And it, there is documentation that is going to help guide you through this. Um, so these are just kind of key points I point out, but all of this is, I listed like this documentation here, and this submitting patches here, it's gonna go over all of these points and it's gonna be a good guide like as you're doing that, just do, it's almost like a walkthrough, right? And then that way you can make sure that you miss all the important parts and your patch is taken seriously. If you miss something, it's okay. Um, somebody will probably respond on the mailing list and being like, hey, your, your sign-off is missing. Um, you're gonna, we're going to need your sign-off on this. Or we're gonna, can you add more description? Or maybe doing a suggestion on your code. Don't take offense if this happens. If you go on the mailing list, everybody is having critiques or suggestions done. That is very normal. This, that's part of the working together part. Um, I know that can be super intimidating, of course, when people are reviewing the code, but it's all part of it. And that's the great thing is like, we're all working towards having better code and better contributions and helping. So um, it's going to be okay if you end up missing a step. There's lots of steps. Um, I found a lot of people on the mailing list are very understanding to that. And a lot of people just want to help. So um, it is okay to forget things or to miss something. We're all, we're all learning. Um, so, um, yeah, just this last part here is documentation. There is a widespread of documentation, which is beautiful, um, from everything we are covering to, so you can just see a list here. It is the development process, uh, code of conduct. Um, you, if you want to learn about subsystem, there is so much documentation. So the beautiful thing is, is this website linked here. You can go there and find this plus so much more. Um, a lot of this documentation is also going to be in your kernel tree. So if you clone any kernel tree down, there's going to be, you're going to find a documentation directory that has all of this for easy reference for you. Just keep in mind, as you update your kernel, the documentation does get updated as well. Um, so there might be a little difference. The website is keeps up to date with whatever the latest release is. So there might be, it, it could always be good, but sometimes do keep in mind if there maybe was a big change in documentation update on the latest kernel, but you're running on an older kernel, there might be a difference. So try to always maybe reference the kernel that you're, um, that you're working on, but there's a lot of these that are gonna always stay relevant, like submitting patches, the essential guide. Um, so there is so much out there to help with this, lots of documentation um, to reference and um, definitely lots of people in the community to help. So here are the resources, lots of it that we've referenced. Um, the only thing that I don't think we talked about is gonna be at the bottom here, is this extra training. 
This is this is done by the Linux Foundation, Beginner's Guide to Linux Kernel Development. This is wonderful. I've gone through this. I've sent this is almost the first thing I send people, and they do just like, where do I start? Um, this is a beautiful guide. It is free, so anyone can do it, and it's going to help you. It's going to go through, and as long as it hasn't changed since I've done it. Um, it's gonna help you write a patch, make a change, walk you through building a kernel, and also talking about the, a lot of what we just covered is gonna be taking you more on a hands-on journey through that. So if you're interested in doing that, highly, highly recommend um, taking this training. It is a wonderful, wonderful resource. And I think that's it. Oh, oh, that was the last slide. We did have a Q&A slide. I think we opted to just get rid of it and sit on here, so. Yeah, that is that is it. Does anybody have any questions for us? Yeah, how do you find uh, a look up maintainers of specific ports like ARM or Risk Five or any any architecture? Is it in the same maintainer list? Yeah, like oh, like who to contact or like yeah. who to think should that? Do you want to take that one or do you? There is actually a script inside the kernel tree. If you run that, it kind of maps who maintains what subsystem. So that's kind of the first thing that we usually look up to figure out whom do we send the patch to uh, instead of just spamming it to a wider audience. So um, that's what I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, that's generally uh, definitely kept up to date in your first. It's a wonderful little script and you just kind of signify like the directory and it's gonna let you know kind of the people that you'll want to uh, reach out to or who, who touches that. So yeah. does that answer that? Okay, perfect. All right, uh -huh. any others? Is, is UML a viable way to test the Linux kernel? Is what is it? UML, user remote Linux. User remote Linux. So it, I, it's been a while since, I, since I've looked at it. Um, I haven't done any kernel development, but yeah. uh, it essentially allows you to run a Linux kernel in, in user mode. Oh, okay, yeah, um, and, uh, I, you user know, I'm- User space, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're catching me and um, want to either like a misunderstanding or maybe a um, thing that I need more knowledge on as well. Okay. Um, but I mean, really, you said for testing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it should be. I imagine I would have- oh. Oh. I think I'm gonna get help here. That'd be wonderful. So the question was if user remote Linux is useful for testing? Oh yeah, uh, there's, yeah, there's the KUnit framework. Uh, that is the framework for unit testing inside the kernel Linux. And he uses UML as a platform. So you can run tests without need to reboot or virtual machine. It's very easy to, to very fast to test with UML. I appreciate you, thank you. All right. Any any other questions? No, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you showing up. <laughs>